I'm sure that most of you are at least vaguely familiar with the concept of intelligent design, especially if you ever engage in debates about the veracity of evolutionary theory. In this video, I want to briefly present five reasons why intelligent design fails. First, a little background. Intelligent design was concocted by a Seattle-based think tank known as the Discovery Institute. The main concepts behind intelligent design were advanced by biochemist Michael Behe and mathematician William Dembski. Intelligent design was claimed to be a scientifically and mathematically viable alternative to Darwinian evolution. However, as we'll see, this claim is erroneous. Now, the first failure of intelligent design is that it isn't science. The hypotheses made by intelligent design are not uh, testable. Intelligent design simply asserts that certain structures or organisms are too complex to have evolved by appealing to nonsensical buzzwords like irreducible complexity, specified complexity, and information. The concept of irreducible complexity posits that certain biological features could not have evolved because if you remove any of the components, the feature loses functionality. Behe uses a common mousetrap as an example of this. They've tried using things like the human eye, the bacterial flagella, and human ear bones as examples. But all of these can be explained evolutionarily. The simple fact is that existing structures can be repurposed for a new use. For example, mammalian ear bones were once jaw bones in reptili reptilian species. We can also see eye complexity increasing via evolution from the very first light-sensitive spots all the way up through the addition of structures like the retina, lens, and iris. It uses the term information to refer to things like the coding that exists within DNA sequences. The argument is that DNA contains information, like blueprints for proteins or specific structures, and all information requires an intelligent force behind it. The problem is that there is no coding within genetic material. It is simply variable sequences of a handful of molecules that sometimes result in biologically functional and active components. We simply view these sequences as a code as a means of comprehending the phenomena. Another tactic often employed by intelligent design proponents is that of Hoyle's fallacy, or that of the junkyard tornado. And basically, this fallacy centers around the fact that the claim that, you know, a tornado couldn't pass through a junkyard and create a fully functional jetliner or a fully functional car with all the uh, component parts in the right places so that it could function smoothly. And the reason this is a fallacy is because inanimate objects in a junkyard do not have inherent forces within them that cause them to interact with the other parts in specific ways and, and that you know can create something whereas molecules do have these inherent forces that only allow them to enter into specific configurations bottom line is that intelligent design has no predictive capability has no claims which can be tested and has no empirical evidence to support it scientifically failure of intelligent design number two it's creationism version 2.0. Supporters of the intelligent design theory, I use that term loosely, love to promote the idea that it only refers to a nebulous intelligent force behind the design in nature and doesn't specify a god or deity of any sort. However, we all know full well that the overwhelming majority of its adherents are of the Judeo-Christian persuasion and consider the designer to be the god of the Bible. Now, as if the parallels between creationism and intelligent design aren't obvious, the evidence trail left by the Discovery Institute left no doubts. The Kitzmiller v. Dover case that took place in Pennsylvania in 2005 was a result of the local school board requiring that teachers present intelligent design as, quote, an explanation of the origin of life that differs from Darwin's view, and inform students that the intelligent design textbook of Pandas and People would be available to them if they were interested. During the case, it was revealed, among other things, that earlier drafts of the text, which eventually came to be known as Of Pandas and People, had initially used the words creationism or creationists in places that eventually said intelligent design or design proponents. The most embarrassing blunder was the hybrid see design proponentists, which was discovered in one draft version, which definitively proved the transition from creationism to intelligent design, the missing link, if you will. 
On top of this, the real smoking gun came in the form of the Discovery Institute's self-proclaimed wedge document, which outlined a broad campaign aimed at defeating materialism, naturalism, evolution, and reversing the stifling materialist worldview and replacing it with a science consonant with Christian and theistic convictions. This document made no attempts at masking the Discovery Institute's goal of infiltrating the American consciousness through any means possible in order to advance their agenda of promoting evangelical Protestant beliefs. Failure number three of intelligent design. The logic, uh, its logic is self-refuting. Because the logic espoused by those who support creationist or intelligent design arguments doesn't even need to be questioned because it's self-refuting. The initial premise is that human beings are too complex to have evolved, and thus they require a creator. However, creationists also believe that humans are designed or created in God's image, and therefore their God is minimally at least as complex as humans, if not more so since it was able to create humans and we lack this ability, well, outside of reproduction. Thus, this means that God is too complex to exist without a designer and would require a designer himself. This leads us to an infinite regress of creators or designers. Now, once creationists are confronted with this logical failure, the only refuge they have comes in the form of special pleading, presupposition, and solipsism. Basically, they will argue that God doesn't require a creator because he is God, even though this is a less parsimonious explanation than the universe being self-creating or eternal. Then they'll argue that nothing could exist without a god, therefore god must exist. And lastly, they'll claim that we only know a small amount of the information available about the universe, and therefore god must exist in the vast amount of information on which humanity is ignorant. And all of this, of course, is fallacious and intellectually dishonest. So that brings us to our next point. Failure of intelligent design number four. The existence of a designer is irrelevant. See, even if we grant the existence of a creator for the sake of argument, there is still zero empirical evidence to support any claims regarding the nature, will, or desires of the creator. We know nothing about it. We don't know why it created anything, what its motives were, if humans were a planned feature or an accidental result, if any specific behaviors are condoned or condemned, etc. Given this, a creator, which we know nothing about, is effectively irrelevant. It doesn't matter if we believe such a thing exists or not, because we cannot use this belief to alter in any way our behaviors or attitudes. Such a worldview is functionally similar to atheism. Now, failure of intelligent design number five. Evolution is true. Yes, lastly and most importantly, intelligent design fails because its central tenet is that the theory of evolution via natural selection is false. So not only does intelligent design fail miserably at being a viable alternative or supplement to Darwinian evolution, but it fails by attempting to discredit one of the most heavily supported theories in all of science. Our entire understanding of biology hinges on evolutionary theory. Evolution is essential to biology. In order to understand this, you have to first understand what the scientific definition of evolution is. It is the change in allele frequency, an allele is a variant of the same gene, in a population over time. This is an observed fact. One easy example that demonstrates this is that of microbial resistance. When a population of bacteria are exposed to an antibiotic, all individual cells in that population that are susceptible to the antibiotic's mode of action will be killed, and any cells with variations which offer the ability to survive the antibiotic will persist and reproduce. The resulting population after several more generations will be different than the original population minimally by the change of alleles which conferred the advantage to survive the antibiotic. Now the next thing to appreciate uh, is what is meant by the word theory in the context of science. A scientific theory is not a hunch or a guess. It is a model which explains how and why an observed phenomena occurs and it's based upon the available empirical evidence. Theories are the best that science can offer. The goal of science is to disprove theories, and the longer that a theory goes without being disproven, and the more evidence which supports it, the stronger the theory becomes. Evolution is supported by a wide range of fields, including archaeology, paleontology, geology, 
genetics, embryology, comparative anatomy, just to name a few. All of the predictions made by evolutionary theory have been confirmed by evidence from all of these fields. Now one last point that I want to make is that what creationists like to call macroevolution is simply the result of evolution over long periods of time. Typically they refer to events such as speciation when referring to macroevolution. Now, while biologists do have a vague definition of species as a group of organisms capable of interbreeding and producing viable offspring, this definition hardly applies in all cases, especially when you venture outside of the animal kingdom. In reality, species is just a false category that scientists use to better categorize and study biodiversity. The fact is that all life is related and that evolution is a constant and ongoing process. Evolution has no final destination, no goal, no preferred outcome. It is dependent almost entirely on the selection pressures acting upon the populations in a given niche. So when creationists demand transitional fossils, what they are effectively demanding is a complete record of every organism to ever live on Earth. Because every individual is transitional, because all life is related, of course, they don't go that far, but what they are asking for is a complete record of major transitions, such as representative, representative uh, individual from each population of organisms that have evolved from having fins to having legs or which evolved wings from arms. They point to the gaps in the fossil record where these transitions can be demonstrated to occur and claim that these quote-unquote missing links are proof that evolution can't be true. However, even when specimens such as Archaeopteryx or Tiktaalik are discovered, they still like to claim that it isn't enough proof. They'll never be satisfied, and that's because they know, like Ken Ham, that no evidence will ever change their minds. They're committed to defending their belief in one primitive Middle Eastern civilization's creation myth, facts be damned. And that is the ultimate reason why intelligent design fails. I am Prototype Atheist. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share with anyone else you think would be interested, and subscribe to my channel for future updates. You can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash prototypeatheist and on Twitter at protoatheist.